Gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it is not because duty calls and that I'm here to be on some official duty, because this is the cause I believe in. Uh, as, as Mr. Bagrodi has said, I've been a lifelong learner, and that's why I feel qualified to be here among the chief learning officers. And that's my main reason. But I must be transparent. It's true that I'm an economist, practicing teaching economist, done that for a long time. And before I start on, on what I have chosen to sort of present to you this morning, uh, I must mention that the most frequently asked question is indeed, what do you do as Secretary of Performance Management? People have heard of Agriculture Secretary, Health Secretary, even Defense Secretary, Foreign Secretary, but never Secretary of Performance Management. So in the coffee break, everyone's asked, what is it? What do you do? So I'll just take a minute you know, because you introduced me so generously that I have to sort of clarify and be transparent. I'll take a story from economics itself uh, to explain what I really do. Everyone in this room who has done economics will quickly agree that economics is considered similar to looking for a black cat in a dark room. That's what they say economics is. Within economics, I have specialized, believe it or not, in economic theory. I have written a book on economic theory. That, they say, is like a blind man looking for a black cat in a dark room. I've gone beyond that. Uh, within economic theory, I've specialized in something called econometrics. For those who know, it is the application of statistics to economics. And that, they say, is like a blind man looking for a black cat, and the cat is not even there. Secretary Performance Management goes a step beyond that. He is a blind man looking for a black cat in a dark room when the cat is not there and keeps saying, I've got it, I've got it. So, so I'm afraid I will be claiming a bit too much in the next 20 minutes or so, but please take it with a pinch of salt. But, but I will share my journey. As I thought about this, and the reason I'm here is really, uh, I shouldn't say it, everyone says it, to really learn and find out, because in the government long time back, I said there should be a chief learning officer. And in fact, I would like anybody in the room who is the chief learning officer to please contact me. We want to create a network and learn from you and create that culture uh, of learning in the government. And having worked across sectors, across countries, public, private, whether you talk about quality management, R&D management, this, there are certain principles, good principles of management, which are transcendental in nature. They apply to learning management as much as to performance management. Let me dwell on those five principles, and then I will show you how we have applied to performance management the same principles that I think apply to learning management. And here are those. The first principle is it's the systems. That you have to have a learning system. It's a system that matters. You cannot just throw money, you cannot have a person. You need to have a learning system, otherwise I think you're wasting your time. If you just say that I am for learning and I have a few workshops, I do have a person, I have a budget, but what about a system? So the first thing, as long as you can remember, from Peter Trucker downwards, go, and I have spoken, to the director of Harvard Business School or MIT Sloan School of Management, talk to them. They'll all agree, all experts agree, that the performance of any organization, of any entity, depends 80% on systems and 20% on people. For us in India, it's not surprising. We're always saying that, look, my God, this guy was such a mediocre. He went abroad and became rich and famous. What happened? Well, what happened was he went to a system where it allowed ordinary people extraordinary things. That's all that happened. So systems is really what matters. And in a bad system, you can get a good person and the person will not function. And we have plenty of examples of that. Air India, I don't want a bad mouth, but you know, it used to be a great airline. Now it is not. And what we did, we got Rusi Modi, who is an icon of management in India, to run. I don't know, bless him, what happened to him. 
Then and there, where it was, Mr. Rudy Mr. Lucy Modi has disappeared from the scene. Then we thought we will get a foreign manager to run Air India, a chief operating officer who is in Austria, because we thought if we can get foreign managers for our cricket teams, certainly we can get for Air India. Maybe it can uh, turn around the situation. And you know the story of what happened to that, gentlemen. In three months, he resigned from Air India, he was so traumatized that he even accepted a job in Kazakhstan. <laughs> that is the level of trauma bad system can cause you. So we should focus on system, not so much on people, but within the people category, it is the leadership that matters. So if, if you don't, if a leader does not believe in learning, forget about the HR and other people. It has to come right from the top. That's the key. And again, it's not surprising in terms of management. Whether you talk about Ashoka the Great or Alexander the Great, they were great. Leaders with tremendous systems, the rank and file rose up to the occasion, conquered the world for them. We don't know the names of the rank and file, but it is the leadership that matters. So all you need to turn around anything is a good leader with a great system, and you can achieve miracles. And that is applicable for learning, that is applicable for almost any field of management. The second principle is that everybody is saying something or the other is important. You know, with due respect, Mr. Bagrodia said that learning is the key. And I go to places where they say, well, R&D is the key, the quality is the key, research is the key to any organization. So what you have is multiple principles. Sorry, I should immediately correct this spelling here. It's multiple principles. Excuse me. Multiple principles. This is real-time learning. I cannot take a spelling mistake like that. Well, it will at least emphasize the point. So it's multiple principles with multiple goals which are conflicting. I mean, clearly you can see that in the context of the government, uh, you have the parliament, the finance ministry, everybody feels they have a right to supervise the government department. Or, you know, this is what matters. The finance people think budget is everything. Parliament has its own priorities. Planning Ministry, the Long-Term Growth Perspective, the Administrative Ministry, the CBI, CHE, CBC, I and mean, the list is huge and it's long. Everybody has a particular perspective. Someone wants learning, somebody would want profits. They say, forget learning, focus on profits. Someone would say political goals, someone would say non-political goals, someone would say equity matters, someone would say efficiency matters. So as a result, the managers in the government or any organization for that matter are confused. What is it? And they sort of don't know what really it takes to win the game. They make profits and say, well, you're not, you know, not thinking of the long run. There's no learning taking place. These profit, profits are temporary, they'll go down. There's no foundation of good solid development of capacity in the organization. So whatever you do, someone will point out. In the government, if you run too fast, they'll say, oh my God, this is not a dash, it's a marathon. Take it easy. You jump high, they say, well, this is a broad jump, not a high jump, so take it easy. Whatever you do, someone's got the perspective. So most people, at least in government, give up. And they say, well, we're just going to survive the system. And if there is collateral benefit for the country, then so be it. I'm not going to go out with my head out for the, for the country itself. And that is not a very healthy Perspective. So second principle of management is that you need to clarify the expectations. There are these conflicting things. Uh, the trade-offs will be there. If you send somebody for learning summit, there will be a cost to it. So you have to make those explicit choices. What is it that you want? And that's good management. Where you don't, you demotivate everybody sort of is, is. Uh, the best I heard was, and if the sound is on, the sound people. Now listen to what Mr. Nandan Nilekani had to say in a CNN interview. <coughs> I'm actually quite supportive. Um, but that's at least the mythology. Now you're in the heart of, of government. How much more difficult is it to deal with the bureaucracies, or which is worse, the bureaucratic obstacles or the political obstacles? Well, I think the way I see it is simply that in 
the private sector, uh, the number of people you have to convince is much less. You convince your management team, your board, your investors, your analysts, and you know, go and do something, go in a new direction, buy a company, whatever. In the public space, you are answerable to a lot more stakeholders. The, the, the government, parliament, bureaucracy, activists, journalists, the judicial system, the investigators, you know. So I think what I've learned is that the amount of time you invest in evangelizing and consensus building is, is hugely much more in the public space. And you know, crafting a strategy which is sort of acceptable to everybody really takes a great deal of time. And that's where the big difference to me in, in the two worlds. Do, do you think that uh, you will... F I don't think we have the time for the, it's a wonderful piece goes on and, and I suggest you should look at the entire story. But the, second, the third principle of management is the not me syndrome. I don't care which organization and where you come from. <clears throat> when things go wrong, everyone blames others. It happens in government, of course, uh, but it happens everywhere. In government, of course, people complain. They complain, say, to Air India that, you know, why can't you be the best airline that you can be in? And you were a great airline. Why can't you be like that? The airline will turn back and say, well, it's nothing to do with me. It's the civil servants in the Department of Civil Aviation who are messing things up. You go up to them and tell Mr. Rohit Nandan from CMB that why can't you do a better job? And he'll say, well, it's not me, it's the politicians who are messing with that. You go and tell them, why can't you leave these commercial enterprises on their own and let them perform the best they can? They will look surprised and say, what do you mean interference? This is our job. People have asked us to do this. So in a sense, people start complaining and the entire buck is passed back to them. So this vicious cycle of passing the buck is very common in many organizations and therefore, a key principle is you need to have a clear understanding who's supposed to do what so that the buck is not passed. And good organizations always do that. There is clarity that when things go wrong, who will be held accountable? And then things don't go wrong. It's when you know you can pass the buck that things go wrong. And so another fundamental principle of good management is total clarity on who's accountable at what stage. I mean, I don't want to run down the government, but uh, you know, that's not my job. I still do need the job in this government. Right? But here is something I like to share. You'll see a classic response, uh, another soundbite, and you'll see how the media perceives, and I'm sure big organizations tend to act like government, whether they are Tata's, Mahindra's, and the bureaucracy creeps into all large organizations. It's not a problem in this world. I mean, I work in the finest organizations at Harvard University, World Bank, and you should see the professors complaining, my God, this is the worst bureaucracy we have come across. And the, you know, the World Bank is going reforming the rest of the world, but talk to a staff member and say, my God, I can't take the paperwork here. It's too much. So it's not, and we used to say that heal thyself, doctor. It's always there, but look, look at this. There's a famous movie called Peepley Live, and I use this as a required watching in, in management uh, when I do the training at Masuri or at any other place. And here is, I want to share so that you understand what we are trying to solve in the government. So this suicide story is really hitting up. The reporters are constantly calling us. Sir, people in two parties are going to be in this issue. It's a national issue now. State government is going to be in the center of the state. Sir, agriculture ministry is going to be in the center of the state. Chai pay again? Pika, look. Find the Argelic tea, back in flush. Sandeep, you are a bad guy. Yes sir, but there is nothing in our hands. There is nothing in our hands. Sir, we will have to intervene in any level, sir. Sandeep, you are a bad guy.
मेथड की एक फाइल तैयार करके नो मिनिस्ट्री से करो कि हाई कोर्ट से रिस्पॉन्स ले लेल खुदकुशी एक कानूनी मामला है और हम हाई कोर्ट डायरेक्टिव के बिना कुछ नहीं कर सकते किसी रिटायर्ड जज जस्टिस शर्मा की एक फैक्ट फाइंडिंग मिशन भेज दो और मीडिया को तो सलीम साहब संभाल लेंगे So it's not about making policies. I've gone on in official fora to say 
that in India, for the next few years, we should have a moratorium on ideas. We have generated a huge amount of ideas which will take us 50 years to implement those. We are not implementing the ideas that we have generated, agreed, debated, but we continue to be in this business of generating ideas, but never worry about implementation. So that's really the focus of my work with the government is to really wrap up, and it's like changing the DNA, it's not a band-aid solution that can happen overnight. It requires blood transfusion, getting the person off the addiction of non-implementation, non-action. It's a long process, but we have started, and we're taking a systemic, a systemic approach. We're focusing on these five principles, and this is, I want to end with a little bit of, uh, the, the last leg, as you see, is called RFD. We think implementation, and this is the main instrument of implementation in the government of India. It's called the Results Framework Doctrine. And I'll just take the next few minutes and then I'll end. The RFD is an instrument that we're using all government departments, all secretaries are asked the following three questions. What are the department's main objectives? I think no secretary, the 80 secretaries that are in the government of India has ever said, I don't know the objectives, they know the objectives. And we ask the next question, what actions do you propose to achieve these objectives? Most of them have an idea about the right action to take. Then the third logical question that we ask is, if these are the actions, how do we know that you're making progress in implementing? What are your key performance indicators or the success indicators? That's all we ask. Now that's why the system has, uh, has moved, I will show, quite far. It's put in a format with six sections, and you can you know, go to our website and see the accountability for all departments in the government of India and 17 states. Uh, they're all on our website in a moment, I'll sh show you. So we have this, it's like a performance agreement between the minister and the secretary to the government, which says all departments, what are, what, is, what are your, what is the ministry's vision, mission, objectives and functions? Second, what are your priorities, key objectives, uh, success indicators and targets, the trend values, last two years data, this year's target, the future, section four, a description of the definitions, section five. This is an interesting section. In government, most of the things that we do depend on each other. For instance, if you want to build a school, you will need to depend on the department for water, for electric, electricity, road, these are all separate departments. And if they don't work together, you can't have a school. So therefore, we have asked departments to specify, to deliver what is expected from them. What is it that they need from other departments? Ex ante, not after the fact. So that we can do something and make sure they are in their performance contracts. And section six is about the outcomes. That is, why do you exist? If we were to abolish a particular government department, why would India miss you, is the question that we ask. And they, they are forced to answer this. They are all, as I said, don't have a... But you may ask, so what's new? Well, everyone knows here in this room the difference between monitoring and evaluation. And you know that evaluation focuses on the bottom line. If you're taking a flight, get into from point A to B, safely, soundly, in a pleasant manner, the least expensive manner is all that you get as a passenger. But the pilot has to look at a huge number of variables. The, the tailwinds, the health winds, the temperature outside, inside, the fuel, large. In fact, the picture is so bewildering, it's like this. This is really the inside of a cockpit. They have to look large in a number of things. In government, the evaluation has been done with the budget we used to use. Then we went on to performance budget to an outcome budget, and now we are using results framework document, RFP. The difference is simple. Budget used to focus only on money. Then we said performance budget, which enlarged the budget and added activities and outputs. Then we said, well, we need outcomes. So the outcomes were added to, to the activities and outputs. Finally, the RFP now has the most comprehensive definition of what a department needs to do both financial, non-financial, static, dynamic, long-term, short-term, quantitative, qualitative, all requirements of a department. So it's the most holistic uh, view of department's performance. That's what it is. It is simply an evolution of the management technology. 
and the technology is called management by objectives. And we have simply, you know, it's just like the phone I have. Uh, I had a phone 25 years back, it's a different fourth generation phone. Similarly, ROG is management by objective, but we have learned from our principles and evolved, and that's what it is. I don't have the time to go into details, those who are interested will be happy to talk about it. It's a fascinating, well, for those who really, really want to know and don't want to spoil your pleasant morning with charts and graphs, but here is the, are the three big differences. You're curious what's so new. The, in government, the first thing that we have done, if you see, it says no, 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 and then yes. On the first one, if I can expand it, are the objectives prioritized? In government, at least, we used to have, you know, give someone 15 objectives, and at the end, the person came and said, well, sir, you had asked us to do 15 things, but out of the 15 things, I have done 12. We didn't know how to measure performance, you know, because it depends. If the three things that they should have done have not been done, then it's, it's bad performance. So therefore, what we have done is we have added prioritization as the first thing, that each secretary is forced to, to think what matters. And again, it's using the general principles of management, it's not public sector management versus private sector. In your organization, I suggest if you're still using long lists without prioritizing, you are in, 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 in not on the cutting edge, let's put it this way. The second, and I'll not go into too many differences, you can have the entire chart, you will have this presentation, a copy of that. That in government, at least, we gave single point targets. You have to build 700 kilometers of road. If the person came and said, sir, you'd ask us to build 700 kilometers of road, but I'm sorry, I could make only 680 kilometers. How do you judge the performance? I said, I submit, it depends. If you like the person, you say, well, that's close enough, let's go and have a beer. If you don't like the person, you say, well, Mr. Trivedi, you're a nice man. Your problem is you never meet targets. And that's the end of your career. So the subjectivity that the bosses have creates in the entire chain of perversion. And then you sort of realize performance doesn't matter, you just need to please your boss, and then things, bad things happen in organization. So we have fixed that problem through the results framework document. This is a sample of this, uh, the methodology, just to give you a sense, because you're all professionals, and I thought uh, it would not be good to just leave it impressionistic. Uh, you don't have to focus, there are three criteria. This is an example of giving weights that you have to decide. Weights, prioritization means out of 100, how important it is. Everything is important, how much more. And it's not a scientific methodology. You're saying, look, this is much more important than this one. That's all. So it's a relative interstate priorities. Then we ask, we don't give them a single point target anymore in the government. We ask, give them a five point. We ask the secretary to the government. And that's really at the top of the line, that what is it that you consider to be excellent? Or what is it that you consider to be poor? We do this at the beginning of the year. So at the end of the year, it's automatic what we get. And I'll share that in a moment. And then if this is the achievement, then you're able to know 50 is between 70 and 80. So you give a score of 75. And then you cannot add up all the raw scores. So you multiply by the weights get a weighted score, when you add it up, you get this bottom line. So our single biggest achievement in applying the five principles that I mentioned was that we have recreated the missing bottom line in the government. The problem is you cannot manage anything without a bottom line. And that was the problem in the government. We had no bottom line. We were doing things, but we didn't know all things considered, did we succeed or did we fail. So by doing this, we have now created a sense. Here is another video which many of you would have seen. It conveys the sense of what we are trying to do. Here is. In fact, the central government know how they did in the draft year. The government's report card is out and it's time to meet the toppers and find out if it didn't quite make the cut. It's time for the minister's report cards. Performance reports of 74 government departments is ready to be presented to the cabinet. NDTV has learned that the cabinet secretariat wants the top ministries to be awarded, but not everyone is happy with this, since in the long run budgetary allocations will be decided by these performance reports.
Have a look at the top performance in 2009-2010, the confidential list with NDTV now. These ministries topped with more than 90% marks. The School Education Department of HRD, the Information Technology and Post Department of the Ministry of Communication, Biotechnology Department of the Science and Technology Ministry, Ministry of Steel, and Ministry of Corporate Affairs. However, ministries like the Information and Broadcasting Ministry did not do well with only 60% marks. I'm happy that the uh, ministries have performed uh, well. We live in a democracy, so if there's ever a praise or a criticism of a certain aspect of a policy, we should be able to tweak it uh, depending on the expectations and the aspirations of the people that we are working for. The ministries are judged by the Cabinet Secretariat, the Planning Commission and the Finance Ministry and it's a tough exam. Ministries getting less than 60% are classified as having fared poorly and you have to get more than 90% to be classified very good and excellent. Critics say those who did well set themselves very low targets. For instance, they got higher marks for spending more money instead of the quality of their schemes which were implemented. The toppers, of course, feel this is right. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs is one ministry you know, where uh, all the improvements have been If the e-governance is perfect here. For a long time, public perception of the government used to be limited to landmarks like this, the Shastri government. But now we can have a more tangible sort of figuring out which department in the Shastri government gets how much marks. Of course, whether those marks are made public or not is going to be decided by the Prime Minister within the next few days. In New Delhi, Sunetra Chaudhary for NDTV. So that, in short, is uh, really what we have done. We have applied all the principles that I just mentioned. And currently, the policy covers 79 departments, 800 responsibility centers. That is, anybody getting a single rupee out of the consolidated fund of India has to now answer what is this money for. So the results has become the big focus as we move on. There's 17 states. I've just come back from Odisha last evening, have adopted and are moving forward and we hope that when, and you know, it has to be an integrated, it can't be at the center and not at the state. And when everything is covered from the government of India all the way to the district level and even lower perhaps, then we will have a results chain, a perfect results chain management. And that's really our long-term dream. You can please visit our website, www.performance.gov.in. Everything that I have said, much more elaboration on every single document, on every single department is available here. You can see um, things, you will be amazed. Uh, it has communities of practice, and in fact, I would like to create a community of practice of uh, learners and learning officers. So please do volunteer and I assure you 